As we get ready to go before the Lord in prayer this morning, we want to acknowledge things that we are truly thankful for. And uh, we're thankful this morning for uh, new members. Janie and uh, Ellis Harris have joined us by transferring uh, their letters of membership. And we welcome you to our You're already part of the family, but now you're officially part, and we welcome you. Uh, we also celebrate this beautiful uh, Thanksgiving arrangement that uh, Sheila and Billy provided. And Sheila came up and put all the hard work into it yesterday, and it, it is so beautiful, and it just lifts the the uh, experience of worship when we can see things like that that remind us of, of what we're doing and we appreciate that. Thank you so much for your yeah. And uh, we also uh, want to lift up those who are on our prayer list this morning and uh, ask are there any others that need to be added? <coughs> And are there any unspoken needs? Just lift your hands. Okay. I do want to add one individual. Uh, Ann Sorley. And uh, she's Sarah Donald's sister. And she has um, been diagnosed with cancer. Okay. And as I ask you to raise your hand for unspoken prayer requests, I realize Greg is here with us and we continue to pray for uh, his hand uh, as he's getting evaluated again this week, as I understand it, so we're praying for that too. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, as we gather together in this place to not only experience worship, Lord, but to participate in worship, lifting our voices in praise, lifting our hearts in thanksgiving as we consider the many mighty works that you have done in our lives and that you have done through our lives as your people, as your church. And so, Father, we are mindful, especially this morning, of how many ways you bless us and of the richness of those blessings, especially, Father, for the gift of your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we gather, Lord, we gather in your name, knowing that you are here in our midst. And so I pray, Lord, that we can still the, the quietness to awe in our spirits, that we can put aside the distractions in our mind and simply be with you in this place at this moment so that we're open to what you would show us and teach us through your scripture, through these wonderful hymns this morning, through the message. Father, may we be inspired, challenged, and then empowered as you send us forth to be the church. And as we gather this morning, Lord, we just ask that your spirit falls fresh on us in this place. And that you guide and direct us, Lord, into new ways of ministry, helping us see where we can walk beside you and work beside you, being a blessing to this community. And as we worship this morning and, and lift our hearts in mindful thanksgiving of all the blessings that we've received, we're mindful also, Father, of the great needs that are all around us. We pray that you would help us be good stewards of this divine grace that you've poured out on us, of all of these blessings, so that we can serve you by serving them, so that we can be a blessing to you, Father, as we bless them. Lord, we lift before you this morning those who are sick, those who are recovering from surgeries, those, Lord, who are dealing with long-term illnesses. We just ask your strength and your healing power to be in their lives and with their bodies. For those who grieve, we pray, Father, that you would gather them up, that you would comfort them and bring hope and peace back to their hearts and minds. And that as we continue to worship this morning in this space, that you would hear our prayer as we lift to you what our Lord Jesus taught all his disciples to say, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is Come, Ye Thankful People, Come. It's 522 and our hymn is here. <laughs> Bless the Lord, all works of the Lord. Sing praise to him and highly exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, sun and moon. Bless the Lord, stars of heaven. Bless the Lord, winter, cold, and summer heat. Bless the Lord, nights and days. Bless the Lord, lightnings and clouds. Sing praise to him and highly exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, all things that grow on the earth. Bless the Lord, seas and rivers. Bless the Lord, all creatures that move in the waters. Bless the Lord, all birds of the air. Bless the Lord, you sons of men. Bless the Lord, you who are holy and humble in heart. 
Bless him, all who worship the Lord, the God of gods. Sing praise to him and give thanks to him, for his mercy endures forever. Please be seated. The ushers will come forward at this time and receive the morning tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, as we come now mindful of how rich your blessings are upon us, may we come truly with gratitude in our hearts. And may our offerings this morning be expressions of our thanksgiving for the many ways that you touch and bless our lives. We pray that you would take and multiply them many times over and send them forth to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen.
When the crowds found Jesus on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe it? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Please be seated. I can very quickly and very easily answer the question, what's your favorite food? By saying, it's not a food, it's a meal. And my favorite meal is Thanksgiving. Hands down, no question asked. Our family gathers together and everyone brings their Thanksgiving offerings for the table. And there's no other time of the year when so many of my favorite things are right there in front of me. And I try to make sure I don't leave out anything somebody brings. So if I do, I'm going to hear about it from my kids, okay? But there's the baked turkey and the fried turkey and baked ham and dressing and shrimp dressing and cranberry sauce and seven-layer salad and green bean casserole and asparagus casserole. English peas, creamed potatoes, cheesy potato casserole, sweet potato casserole, starting to figure it out now, stuffed celery, deviled eggs, ham rolls, yeast rolls, Watergate salad, pumpkin pie, eggnog pumpkin pie, pecan pie. There is a lot to choose from when we all get together on Thanksgiving Day. It is a true celebration of all of God's bounty. All you've got to do is walk right across the yard, Vince, you live right next to the Chicago Islands. And it's also an occasion for, for laughter and for just loving on each other and being in each other's presence and for my sons-in-law, a nice time for some good snoring afterwards while I'm trying to watch the game. You know? So, uh, but it's a great time. Now, your Thanksgiving meal may be a little different from uh, mine in some ways, but there's one thing I would bet we're all guaranteed to have when that meal is finished, and that's leftovers, right? There's always some leftovers, and you know what leftovers are? They're a sign that everybody got all they needed to eat, that most people got more than they needed to eat, that everyone was blessed, no one went away empty, and there's still enough for another meal. We're people who have a lot for which to be thankful. But the most important thing to remember is that we have enough. We have enough to eat. We have enough clothes to wear. We have enough shelter to protect ourselves. We are rich in these blessings where so many in other parts of the world and even in our own country, in our own state, in our own county are not. And beyond our physical needs, God gives us all enough of his love to experience joy and enough of his grace that we can find peace. So why aren't we celebrating and expressing our gratitude for God's abundant blessings? 
Why aren't we responding to God's extravagant love to us with our own extravagant generosity of all these blessings that he's given us so that we can do his work? So that we can do his ministry. And I believe the thing that gets in the way of our ability to recognize all of our blessings and to express true gratitude is this desire for more. We have enough, but that's never really enough, is it? We want more. And there's nothing wrong with having more than just the bare necessities. But when the getting more becomes the focus of our life and our life's energies and our life's passions, then we leave the straight and narrow path. This never-ending struggle to amass more possessions can cripple our Christian witness, can compromise our prayer life. We stop praying for others. We stop praying to find God's will when all we're doing is praying for more, for more. God, I really want this. God, I really need this. God, I want that. I want that. I want that. I want that. And it can wreck our happiness because we're never really content. So we need to acknowledge that God has provided for all of our needs through his riches in Jesus Christ, just as he promised. And the realization that God has provided for us so faithfully, supplying our needs, is what brings us to a place of true thanksgiving and real gratitude. And it's important for us to, to name those blessings, to, to claim them, and not only to remind us to be faithful, but it's important for us to acknowledge all of those blessings because living that life of gratitude towards God will empower us to trust him in extraordinary situations for service and ministry when we find that we lack what we need for that particular situation. Not that we lack what's necessary for life, but we find that we're confronted with something that we're not equipped for. And there are times when we realize that we lack what's necessary to face some particular challenge or situation. And in those situations, we have to look to God for the strength, for the wisdom, for the blessings necessary to give us victory in those moments. I think about examples in the scriptures. I think about Moses. He sees that bush burning on the side of the mountain that burns and burns, but it's never consumed. And he says, I've got to go check this out and see what that's about. And his curiosity leads him up there and he encounters the Lord there in that burning bush. And the Lord tells him, I'm going to free my people who have been in bondage down there in Egypt and you're the guy I'm sending to go do it. And Moses says, no, 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 no. I am not the guy. I'm not eloquent in speech. I don't have the, the, the presence. I don't, I, I, I'm not your man. He gave 101 reasons why he was not the right man for the job and had no gifts or abilities that would allow him to do this great work. What did God respond? Do you remember? I mean, if I asked, do y'all know the story of Moses? You'd say, yeah, I know the story of Moses. Then what was God's answer to Moses? Moses says, I don't have what it takes. I don't have what I need to do all of this. And God said, well, what do you got? He said, what's in your hand? And Moses said, it's a stick. It's a rod. That's all. God said, throw it on the ground. He threw it on the ground, what happened? Got to really dig deep. It turned into a serpent. It scared Moses. And Moses ran from it. God said, calm down, Moses. Take it by the tail. And he did. It became a stick again. He said, God, see, I'll handle this part of it. You just take your stick and go do what I'm telling you to do and trust me to do the rest. That's what God does when we offer him what we have. It's all that's needed. And Moses took that rod and performed miracles with it, convinced the Israelites that he had been sent by God, convinced Pharaoh that this is something he didn't have a choice about, 
parted the Red Sea, brought water from the rock to water all of the Israelites and their flocks over and over and over again, led the Israelites to the borders of the Promised Land. Moses said, God, I don't have what it takes to do this thing. All I got is a stick. And God said, that's enough. Give me what it is you have and watch me work. Then there's David, young boy. His dad sends him to go take some cheese and some clothes and some extra food to his big brothers who are fighting with King Saul and his army against the Philistines. And when David gets there, he looks down in the valley below them and hears this giant, literally giant man, nine feet tall, standing down there cursing God, mocking God, mocking the nation of Israel. And David's beside himself. He said, hey, who's going who's to go kill that dude? And they all looked at him and said, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. nope. Oh, you got a good look. I mean, he's way far away. Can you figure out what you're looking at down there, David? David said, I don't care. It doesn't matter. It's not me or you that's going to be doing the fighting. It's God. Somebody go down there and stop that Philistine from mocking God. And so they took him to the king, and Saul said, okay, you want to go? Go. And Saul put his own armor on David and all this. And remember, this is a time when Israelites, uh, the average height of them was very, very, very short. Saul was six foot, and he stood head and shoulders above all the other Israelites, the scripture said. Well, he took this armor and put it on a 13-year-old boy, and David was standing there just trying to stand up with all this stuff and the big sword and all this. And David said, man, I can't use this junk. I haven't been trained and I don't know what any of this stuff is. And he paused it all off. They're like, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to take what I got, my slingshot. That's all I need. And off he went. And he stops on the way and bends down in the little stream down there and picks up five smooth stones and puts them in his pouch and goes and he faces the giant because he knew it wasn't him. It was God. And all he had to do was be faithful and God would do the rest. And God did. And won a great victory for the Israelites that day. And then there was the widow whose husband had died. And she was left there with her sons and she, she went to the prophet Elisha. And she said, Elisha, my husband has died and, and I can't pay all that we owe and the creditors are coming to take my sons away. They're going to take my sons and, and make them servants to pay the debts. What am I supposed to do? And I'm sure you all remember what Elisha said. And if you don't, you should figure it out by now. What did Elisha say? He said, what do you got? And she said, nothing. He said, no, what do you got? Said, well, I've got one little uh, cruise of oil in the house and that's all. Elisha says, that's enough. Go borrow all the vessels and pots and things that you can from your neighbors. Everything you can borrow that will hold anything, go borrow it. And so she and her sons went and did that and brought in, filled the rooms in the house up with jars and jugs and everything else. And she said, okay, now what? And he said, start pouring out oil. She said, okay. She was obedient. She did. She started pouring and pouring and pouring. And every vessel she came to, it was filling it up. And, and finally she told her son, she said, bring me another vessel. And they said, there's not any more. That's it. And she looked around and they're all full of oil. And she asked Elisha, they're all full. I don't have any more. What do I do now? And he said, go sell all that oil and pay your debts. And be thankful because God took care of you. You see, you don't have to have it. You just have to offer what it is you do have. And this passage that we read this morning about the people finding Jesus, they went hunting him because he had just fed about 15,000 people. There were 5,000 men. They only counted the men who were of fighting age. They didn't count the ones too old or too young. They didn't count the women. They didn't count the girls. There was probably around 15,000 people that Jesus had just fed. And that's why they were hunting him down. They wanted to make him king because of what he did. But the disciples came to Jesus because these people followed him out into the wilderness. And they said, Lord, you got to send these folks home. He said, why? 
He said, because they're hungry. And Jesus said, well, give them something to eat. And they looked at him like he'd lost his mind. He said, we can't feed this bunch of, we don't have enough food to feed us. We're going to have to go find something. What do you mean? How are we supposed to feed such a big crowd? What did Jesus say? Somebody, thank you. What do you got? That's exactly what it is. Well, what do you got? And they said, well, this kid's got five little barley muffins and two sardines, two little fish. That's it. And Jesus said, okay, that'll work. And they said, no, you don't, do you see how many people there are out here? He said, go tell them to sit down. And they did. And Jesus gave thanks to God for those five little barley loaves, those five little muffins and those two little fish. And he broke the bread and he said, now go pass it around among the people. And the disciples just said, ooh, but they did it. And everybody there ate their fill. And most of them had never experienced that in their lives. They literally lived day to day for food. And they filled their bellies. And when they were done, Jesus said, now go gather up all the food that's left over. Huh? Yep, go do it. We're not wasting anything. Okay, and they came back. How much did they bring back? Twelve baskets full that was left over. That little boy went home with a lot more than he brought to the party. But he was willing to give what he had. And when we take whatever it is that we have, when God says, what you got, it's going to be enough when he's done. And that's what we have to remember. Whatever we may have might not be enough for the situation that we're facing, but it doesn't have to be. We only have to exercise our faith in God and give it to him, whatever it is. Just like the widow giving her very last two half pennies, her two little mites and putting in that collection box, all that she had left, but she was giving it to God. And when we exercise our faith in God that way, miracles happen. That's why Paul said we are to be thankful in every situation. Not necessarily for that situation, but in every situation and give praise to God because God, through our faith, is going to do something amazing, something wonderful. He's going to do something miraculous with whatever it is that we have offered to him. Because we offered it in faith, knowing that God is going to work a mighty work. And it all begins with the acknowledgement on our part that it's going to happen because God loves us. It's going to happen because of God's grace in our lives. And it all starts when we offer our thanksgiving. Our gratitude to God. First, for his priceless gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And then we give thanks for all that he's already done in our lives. We offer our gratitude for his faithfulness to provide for us in every situation, to meet every need, and to bless, bless us in the face of every adversity, even in the very presence of our enemies. One of the most wonderful songs of thanksgiving is something that we tend to save for funerals. And it, it speaks very powerful to us in that moment. But it's a song of thanksgiving that David wrote. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm not going to want for anything because he's going to take care of me. And he's going to take care of me by leading me and making me lie down in green pastures. By walking me along beside the still waters where I'm in no danger and I can go and be refreshed. He restores my soul. Can you hear the joy in that? He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is thanksgiving in its purest form. That is a deep expression of gratitude bursting out of David's heart for all that God has done for him. There's so much that God is trying to do in all of our lives, in your life. Don't whine and grumble like Moses did in front of that bush. Say, oh, I'm not, I'm not capable of doing this. I don't have what I need in order to, to do this stuff. Because God already knows you don't. Don't say, well, I, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, wise enough. God already knows you're not. I saw a poster about six years ago that, for me, greatest motivational poster ever. You know what it said? It said, when God calls you to do something, he has already factored in your stupidity. Now, think about that for a moment. Don't sit there and go, I'm a preacher, call me stupid. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying when God calls you to do something, he already knows what you're capable and not capable of. He already knows all of your faults and your flaws. He knows the limits of your human abilities, but he's not working with human abilities. He's God, and he's fixing to do a mighty thing. And so we can say, yes, Lord, send me. I can't wait to see what you're fixing to do. And I'm so excited that you've chosen me to be a part of that. God has already given you what he plans to use to accomplish his will through you. Whether it's a, a stick, a slingshot, a, a, an empty jar, some bran muffins and a couple of sardines, whatever it is, nothing is not enough when God starts to work and anything becomes everything when we offer it up to God. And that includes you and me. Whatever we are, whatever we have, it's enough for God to use to bring revival to your life, to your family's life, to bring revival to God's church and to bring redemption to the lost around us. The key is for us to recognize that God is sufficient, not us. We don't have to be. He is. So when we turn from those selfish prayers for more to offering prayers of thanksgiving for what he's given us, when we turn from grumbling to gratitude, then we can begin to live lives that God is going to use to channel his power and his blessings into this world. Don't make Thanksgiving a once a year memorial meal to God's provisions. Make it a lifestyle that returns praise and honor to him every day. Lift your voice in praise and adoration because God will receive your worship and will continue to bless you in ways that you can't even imagine. Show God your gratitude and your appreciation for his grace. And know that that grace truly is sufficient for you in every situation. Then get excited about what he's fixing to do because God is fixing to make you truly thankful. So let me ask you, church, what do you got? Because whatever it is, if you put your faith in God, it's more than you think. And it's always going to be enough. Our closing hymn is 35. For the beauty of the earth.
that whatever we have, Father, is more than sufficient to accomplish what you have set before us because we rest our faith in you. And may your love, may your grace, may your mercy continue to fill us and bless us as we lift our hearts and our spirits and celebrate your bountiful love with great thanksgiving. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 